Yeah, hello everyone, thank you for coming and thanks to the organizers for making things possible. Um, let me start by putting a question or a choice before you. Imagine it's your task to bring down a wall and all you have to, or all the, uh, the, the tools you have to achieve this um, is a very tiny hammer. Now there are two options. Option A, which is on the left, consists in taking your tiny hammer to a massive solid wall and then you start hammering away like crazy. In option B, um, you also have to do some hammering, but at the same time what you can do is you can influence the construction process of the wall. So you can make sure the wall, while it is being built, is not very solidly built. So it's probably very thin, very low, full of holes and cracks. So you still have to do some hammering to bring it down, but it might be much easier to do so in this case. So let's do a show of hands. Which option would you choose? Option A or option B? Who's in favor of option A? Raise your hands. That, that's not quite a lot. Who would choose option B instead? All right, this is no surprise, okay? Actually, this is a no-brainer. So the question is, um, why aren't we doing this when it comes to our fight for animals? Why are we all choosing option A? Let me explain this. The animal rights movement strives to achieve a better world for animals. It might look something like this here, right? So humans and other animals living together in perfect harmony, no unnecessary killing or suffering. However, between us and this goal, this future world, there's a massive wall, wall. And this wall represents the attitudes and behaviors of most people who are non-vegans. So people believe in, for example, speciesism, carnism, anthropocentrism, or human superiority, and they act accordingly. So they support directly or indirectly animal suffering, killing, abuse, and exploitation. So as activists, our job is to bring down these walls, right? We have to change attitudes and behaviors of people. That's our job. Now the crucial thing to bear in mind here is, and that very often gets ignored, and that's why I'm doing this presentation, those attitudes and behaviors don't just fall out of the sky. In fact, they are largely determined in a very important period of life, that is during childhood and adolescence. The little hammer you can see here <clears throat> represents the limited tools we have to achieve change. So that's probably the various strategies we apply, like rational emotional appeals, exerting pressure on um, companies and institutions and so on. The solid wall in option A represents the um, firmly entrenched and established um, beliefs and attitudes of people during early socialization. And the unstable wall in option B represents the less firmly established beliefs and attitudes of people because they have been exposed to the animal issue during this early period of socialization. So the general idea is um, in option B, you address not only the effect or the symptom of the problem, but you also simultaneously address the cause. So you consider where these attitudes and behaviors come from. You don't just stand back and let all this happen. Okay, it's given up its ghost. Right. So the central premise of my talk is early intervention, so that is educating young people about animal protection or humane education, counteracts the development of problematic attitudes and behaviors. And then the mental walls in adults will be less solid or ideally even non-existent. However, most current activism is directed at adults. Um, and the root problem, where these attitudes and behaviors come from, 
keeps getting ignored. So there's an imbalance if it comes to approaching these t different kinds of demographic. And I think this way, animal advocacy won't get any easier in the future. So there's a quote by the 19th century American poet, philosopher, naturalist, and abolitionist, Henry David Thoreau, who said, there are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. And I think this nicely kind of summarizes this imbalance I wish to address today. So my central claim is we need more animal advocates and activists who also strike at the root, so they redress this imbalance we are facing at the moment. So don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that most current activism is misdirected, not at all. But what I think is we need to supplement this, what is happening at the moment, with another strategy. So we have this short-term strategy which kind of tries to change existing behaviors and attitudes in, in adults, and we should sort of um, combine this with another strategy that's more long-term and that addresses the formation of the attitudes and behaviors. So let me, tell me, to, let me tell you what got me thinking about all this in the first place. So it's basically two things. And the first thing was frustration with my own activism. I run a website with rational arguments um, in defense of animal rights. And I also offer workshops on this subject, and I've done so in the last couple of years at this conference as well. And I always thought all I need to have are the best rational arguments, and that's, that just will settle everything, right? So because I thought, well, people are rational and moral individuals, and they will understand and accept rational and moral premises and conclusions, and ideally act accordingly. Of course, that was wildly naive. I soon realized that in real life, good arguments are just not enough. Right? Because rational moral arguments are not always met with acceptance um, or adoption, but mostly they trigger irrational, inconsistent, and very often unethical responses in people. And that's, of course, highly frustrating. So very often the, the arguments people come up with in defense of their habits and, and convictions, they're not really arguments, but they are rationalizations. Right? Rationalizations are psych is a, a rationalization is a psychological defense mechanism. And it consists of making excuses for, for pro and, and by providing seemingly rational explanations for a behavior that is actually otherwise motivated. And those rationalizations, they aim at two things, basically. First, they aim at defending one's problematic attitudes and behaviors to oneself and to others. And they also aim at protecting one's self-concept, right, as a rational and moral person. So people want to keep doing what they have been doing all the time because they like it, like eating meat, for example. And at the same time, and although they know there's some, there might be something wrong with this, at the same time they want to conceive of themselves as rational and moral persons. And um, rationalizations just help them to achieve this trick. And this is why I think that rational appeals may not be sufficient. Maybe not always, but I think with the majority of people they might, might, not, might not be sufficient. And I've tried to visualize this with three levels. So on the top level, we've got arguments, or in many cases, just rationalizations. And they are there to protect attitudes and beliefs of people, like humans are superior or animals are there for us to use them. And these attitudes and beliefs, again, are there to protect behaviors. So the behavioral level is the, is the lowest, the basic level. And our ultimate goal as activists is, of course, to change behaviors, not just attitudes. And of course, I realized doing rational argumentation, I was just scratching at the very surface of all this. So my focus changed from asking how best to rebut people's arguments, because I didn't really see the point in that. I, I went to the question, why do people come up with these so-called arguments in the first place? 
So at this point, it might be helpful to take a deeper look at um, the different strategic approaches to social change, and there are basically two different approaches. The first one might be termed attitudinal approach. Right? So the idea is um, attitudinal change leads to behavioral change. Right? And to create attitudinal change, we use rational or emotional moral appeals. So for example, we tell people, don't eat meat because it harms animals, it's bad for them, it's the immoral thing to do, and then people will accept this and change their attitudes and behaviors accordingly. Then there is the behavioral approach, which is quite the opposite to the first one. The idea here is that behavioral change will lead to attitudinal change. So to create behavioral change, we need to change the environment. So that means we need to break the habits or dependencies of people. And um, that will lead to attitudinal change. So probably you would say we don't need to talk to people about the morality or immorality of killing and eating animals, for example, but you just try to provide an alternative to that practice. You say we, we create in vitro meat or stuff like that that is quite the same thing, so people can keep their habits, but without harming animals in the process. And once this, this dependency is broken, people will change their attitudes because there no longer is this need to rationalize and to defend their practices. Right? You, might, you might feel that, okay, we've given up on morality completely here, but that's not the case. So I think if we break these dependencies, this enables a real moral and rational debate in the first place because before that wasn't even possible because people acted like, yeah, like uh, people dependent on drugs, for example. Right? So as long as they are on drugs, and dependent on this, um, rational argumentation very often doesn't do the trick. So back to rationalizations. There's also some good news here. Um, rationalizations are an indication of, of some kind of inner conflict, of a cognitive dissonance probably. And this also tells us one thing, that deep inside people seem to care. Right? They just don't allow this, this caring to come out and to, to, to work on them. And what most activism today does is they try to seek to reconnect people with that deep inner caring. So the questions that came to my mind when thinking about this was, where does this caring come from in the first place? And why don't we try to prevent the disconnection rather than just focus on trying to reconnect people again? Right? So why do we stand back and let all this happen? The other thing that got me thinking, beside frustration with my activism, was children making the connection. And I want to share some of the stories with you. You probably all know this famous video about Luis Antonio. He's, um, it's a YouTube classic now. And at a dinner table, he asks his mom about the food on his plate, right? There's octopus on the plate. And he refuses to, to eat the octopus once he realizes that the octopus is, or rather was in this case, an animal. So for the benefit of those who don't know the video, it'll play just a very short part of it. I hope this is going to work. So, what are they to come out and they might? And it's interesting to follow his reasoning, right? Okay. For a gente poder comer, meu amor. Porque eles morrem. Não gosto que eles morrem. Porque eles morrem. He knows, right? <laughs> right, and here's another one. This is Genesis Butler from the US. When eight-year-old Genesis Butler was just three years old, she asked her mom where her chicken nuggets came from. So I told her the truth. I said, you know what, we kill animals for it, sweetheart. And she was devastated. She said, you know what, I don't want to do this again. That day, the second grader decided to become a vegetarian. And three years later, she went vegan. Right, and here's another one. This is a boy called Adrian in Nepal. 
And this is Adrian's first visit to a temple. And at this temple, there's some sort of sacrifice ritual going on where people bring goats to sacrifice them. And Adrian is there with a, a goat of his own, and he realizes that his new animal friend is going to be next in line. See what happens. And don't worry, it's, it's got a happy ending. It's also instructive to read the comments of the adults. So kids know killing is not good, right? Okay, and this is the last example. You probably know this guy. This is um, famous US actor Joaquin Phoenix, who is also vegan and an animal rights activist. He did the voiceover for the documentary Earthlings. And he recalls in, a, in, a, in an interview the story of how he and his siblings became vegan when he was three. I'm just going to read this out to you. There were five kids and we literally screamed at our parents and said, we are never going to eat meat again because we were on a boat and they were catching fish and they were throwing fish against the side of the boat in order to kill them. They were flopping around and it was undeniable that it was brutal, barbaric and horrible for us. And so we said that. I remember my mom not being able to answer and we said, why didn't you tell us that's where meat came from? And she didn't know what to say. I feel like I have this memory of seeing her crying. So what do these children have in common? I think what they have in common is they all have a special connection with animals and they care about animals. They don't want to see them suffer or die at the hands of humans. They also realize that many aspects of our daily life, from food to tradition, harm animals. And they make the connection. And crucially, these children make a stand against it. They don't accept it. Can you relate to these stories, unless you're a vegan native? Does that ring a bell with you? Well, I can relate to this. Because these clips and stories got me thinking about my own childhood story. And my story is much less impressive and inspiring than, say, Joachim Phoenix's. And I think that my story, sadly, is much more of a typical story. I also loved and cared about animals when I was a child. I was infuriated, I was angry and upset when I saw animals suffering or, or when I saw cruelty and abuse um, affecting animals. I even started my own environmental slash animal protection organization when I was 11. And we even made an investigative report at a local fur shop. But I failed to make the connection with food, zoos and circuses. I still ate meat, I still went to zoos and circuses. I was just a single issue campaigner at that time. And I also lost even this interest in the, course, in the following years. I only started worrying about animals again when I turned 18 and I very slowly rationalized my way to pescatarianism. It took me many years to get there. 
And today I feel silly right, doing rational argumentation and completely forgetting about the way how I myself rationalized half my life, um, why I didn't eat cows and chicken, but still fish, because I thought, wow, they're much more primitive and simple creatures, they probably don't feel anything. Um, at least I'd love that to be the case. So I only became vegan 24 years after my fur protest and three years after I really submerged myself in animal ethics and thought about all the implications and that completely changed my mind then. And my sense today is, um, what a waste of time. Looking back, I wish someone had been there to support me in this initial stage when I started my um, animal protection organization. And I always wonder how my life might have taken a very different course. So this is the kind of summary, I think, about what we've seen so far. Um, children start their journey of life with a kind heart. Right? So they care about animals, they don't want them suffering or killed. But this original kindness that is there is not cultivated. It is eradicated instead. Parents, family, friends, society as a whole, including, crucially including, the educational system. And only very few of these children really make a stand, like the few we've just seen. All the others adopt the beliefs, attitudes, convictions, and defense mechanisms of their environment, and they learn to partake in a system. And they become speciesists, carnists, and support practices that harm animals. And what about most animal activism? We have so many fantastic forms of activism, we just need to look around at this conference, it's so inspiring. But most of this sets in when it's almost, or when it's definitely too late, it's right down here, when this whole process has run its course, then we start attacking this. And this is why I think because we fight attitudes and behaviors in, in adults rather than also try to address the origin of all this, this is why our activism will stay difficult or more difficult than it needs to be in the future. So you may feel this is a bit of an oversimplification, the summary in my statement, and maybe you, th you think things are more complex in real life, and probably, probably they are. And you may wish to make a couple of objections, so I try to anticipate them. You might say, um, do re children really have this natural, special connection with animals, and is it therefore good that they have this connection? And isn't cruelty to animals quite common among young people? Um, well, I think as far as the special connection is concerned, I think that's quite obvious, right? Animals are center stage um, in much of daily life of children. If you look at the toy industry, if you look at stories, books, movies, it's animals basically everywhere for a reason. Right? There's a whole industry centered around the, the fact that you can use animals to sell products to children, right? Because there is this special connection. So I think that is quite clear. The question whether it's natural or innate, um, I think the fact that we saw different clips from different cultural backgrounds also shows us one thing. It can't be nurture alone. It, it is kind of a universal thing. So it must be innate. Or it must be there by, by nature. And the question whether that is good, well, it causes no harm, but prevents harm. So yes, positively, yes, it is good. Right? In our understanding of ethics, it's good because it doesn't cause harm. So there's no doubt about this. The cruelty question is more difficult to answer because sometimes kids do act cruelly. But there are lots of developmental psychologists who say, um, we shouldn't worry too much about this. This might be just a stage, and it's very often part of their normal development. So probably it's sort of a rebellion against parents or against authority in general. And that's the only way to, to, to get this out of the system is to pick on the weaker, usually animals. So in general, I think the closer connection and greater affinity in children is, is a fact. You might also want to object um, that we don't just toughen children up, but we also teach them kindness to animals. And that is true, of course. So most parents teach children to be kind to individual animals, mostly in direct encounters. So you tell your child not to, to pull the kitty's tail or stuff like this. Right? But at the same time, we desensitize them to the large-scale, systematic suffering and killing of animals. 
We develop different categories like pets and food. So in general, we teach children inconsistent and confusing attitudes and behaviors towards animals. We've got kindness and care on the one side, and we've got willful ignorance and indifference on the other side. And the last objection you might want to raise is animals do already feature in the educational system, so there's no need to introduce that. It is true, animals do feature there, but only as objects. Right? So that's a very anthropocentric perspective, a very instrumental and technical perspective. So very often, school books focus on the ecological or economic function of animals. Right? So when you discuss environmental protection or climate change or species preservation or food protection. And we also, in the textbooks, very often focus on, on the biological or phys physical facts, anatomy or physiology. So the question is, how many teeth does a rat have or how many bones are in the skeleton of a dog? So that's very technical. It's physical. But what we don't find is teaching children about animals as individuals with inner lives and cognitive, emotional, social capabilities. So that's what modern ethology is just beginning to unravel and, and present to us. And of course, there's nothing at all about ethical animal protection. So not just protecting animals because we want to preserve a species, which has nothing to do with an ethical animal protection approach. What needs to be done, from my point of view, is the following. We need to teach children about animals as complex, sentient, emotional, um, social and individuals with their own needs, interests, and of course vulnerabilities, not just as objects or in terms of their, their functions. This is kind of, I think, an implicit approach, right? We rectify the rather distorted and one-sided image of animals. And my hope is, because children have this greater openness and, and closer connection, that this alone will already do a lot for them to, to make them think and also to come to the right conclusions. So that's a kind of an implicit animal protection education, even though you don't even mention the, the, the word edu um, protection. But we should also teach children explicitly about animal protection. And especially, crucially, we need to take these topics to the educational system, and we need to institutionalize them, rather than just leave it to the parents or to some committed individual teachers who find this is an important topic or not. It needs to be um, a mandatory, obligatory subject. And I think we should customize and apply all forms of activism we know today and also use them with younger people. And of course, we need to do some customizing here because not everything can just be applied. We can't show earthlings to preschoolers. Um, you may recall these different approaches we talked about, the attitudinal approach and the, the behavioral approach when it comes to um, achieving social change. And I believe it's about time we introduced another approach here, which is not an alternative, but rather a complement. It's kind of a meta approach. It's the early intervention or humane education approach. And the idea is, quite obviously, early intervention creates less stable attitudes and behaviors. And that facilitates both attitudinal and behavioral approaches, right? So the last one kind of helps the other two. No matter whether you, you stick with this or that one, if you also subscribe to early intervention, you will make your life easier in the future. So now let's take a look at um, what speaks in favor of putting animals on the educational agenda from an outside perspective. First, so not from the perspective of activism. Um, number one, if we, and I use the word humane education here just to refer to animal protection for ethical reasons, right? That's just um, um, an umbrella term I use. Um, first, it helps to spread and promote acknowledged social values. As we've already seen, many parents teach their children to be kind to animals, right? And in many countries, the moral and legal protection of animals is part of the cultural and political um, value system. So it makes sense to include them in the educational system as well and give it some kind of official status rather than, than an add-on. Number two, it serves the fundamental freedom of information and it helps young people to become autonomous, authentic individuals. 
currently the information about animals, as I've tried to point out, is, and animal protection is insufficient, it's biased, it's one-sided, it's distorted. And I think we need um, to rectify this. And otherwise, young people don't have all the information they need to make considered choices. Number three, it encourages the development of empathy, altruism, compassion, and a sense of responsibility. And it can, can make a very important um, pedagogical contribution to raising social awareness among children, to better understanding of those who are different also, because animals are very different compared to other humans. It can also help to support those who are weak and also to tolerance, thoughtfulness, and care and it can even help to prevent violence. So this positively impacts not only our interaction with animals, it also positively impacts all forms of social interaction. So it's a very strong argument, I think, for putting animals and their protection on the educational agenda. And number four, it overlaps with other important areas. As you all are aware, the intersectionality aspect of um, animals, you've got social justice, world hunger, environmental degradation, resources depletion, climate change, health, violence, just to name a few. And I think that's very important because it can help young people as future agents and consumers to decide and act competently and responsibly. Right? So they need all these information and they also need the connection between the different areas. Now let's look at the internal pros, that is why animal activism should focus more on young people. Unfortunately, I have to admit, the, the research record is rather thin here, so you don't find a lot about um, approaches, strategies with children. But it's my hope that once we get this debate started, there, there might also, this might spark interest in the subject and inspire um, more research, hopefully. So, number one, it's a preventive approach rather than a curative one. And um, I think, as with health issues and in many other areas of life, usually preventive approaches are more promising than curative approaches. Right? You try to prevent things from going wrong rather than fixing them later on after they have gone wrong. Number two, intervention may be easier. So, because, people, uh, because young people are more open to new ideas, and because of their closer connection to animals, this might be easier than with, with adults. Of course, there is, this, is, this is kind of um, 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 set back by the fact that we have to deal with, with parents, right? So this is the, the, um, the offset here, the resistance of parents, of course. Intervention might also prove to be more solid. So because socialization process is still incomplete or in the making, this might allow for the animal protection message to, be, to get deeper, deeper entrenched in the value system of young people. Intervention might also prove to be more sustainable. Right? Young people have a longer lifespan ahead of them to, to kind of translate their ideas and new ideas into action and to spread them. And there's also a long-term multiplication effect. So we always need to bear in mind young people are not just individual consumers or agents, but they're also tomorrow's social, political, um, economic and scientific leaders. So if these people with the right mindset move to positions of power, they have a huge, huge potential to later on bring about lots of change on the institutional level, which is crucial for our uh, mission. And there's one area that has so far received very little attention, and that's kids as activists. Um, and that's kind of a short-term multiplication effect. So even if kids turn vegan or vegetarian at a young age, it's not just that their behavior changes, it might also affect um, the way they want to become proactive and do something. So this is Genesis Butler again, the girl we, we met in one of the clips before. And not only did she turn vegan, um, she also became a very powerful activist. And in an interview, Genesis was asked whether people react differently to her as a young activist. And here's what she says. I quote, 
They like that I'm a kid who is doing what I believe in. They are really interested in what I have to say. And I think they take me more seriously because I, they know I'm speaking from my heart. They listen to me more than adults. When my mom tells people she doesn't believe in killing animals for food, they give her lots of excuses. When I tell them the same thing, they listen and they want to know more. There are even more pros if we don't just focus on children as individuals, but also on the educational system. So the first thing, of course, is we can use an existing structure. Right? We've got this powerful, comprehensive educational system. Every single child has to pass through. So we don't need to build this, it's already there. We just need to make use of that in an intelligent way. We also have a multiplication or multiplier approach because on all levels, from humane educators who give presentations at schools to the regular teachers, to the institutions themselves, to teacher trainings and the whole system, these are all multiplier effects. So we can use that to spread and multiply the message. Moreover, it's very important to communicate the animal issue in a school setting because that can lend it additional credibility and give it official status and that's very, very important because educational institutions have this special authority and very often you have teachers as role models and that might have a long-term effect. So I don't know when I started my animal um, protection organization what would have happened if I had had a teacher who kind of nurtured this and fostered my interests. We can also use group dynamics, so when several young people simultaneously decide to, to go vegetarian or vegan in a class, they might support each other, so you can use these dynamics in a positive way to do that. And last but not least, very interesting also from an activist perspective, there's a unifying factor in here. Right? We have this division in the animal rights movement between people who believe in abolitionism, people who believe in animal rights, people who believe in animal welfare, and so on. And I think these divisions are much more less, or much less relevant in the context of outreach to young people because you can't communicate some of the very complex um, concepts at a very young age. So the younger the people are, I think the less relevant these differences are. And I think that also can help us to unify efforts and focus on this. So finally, I want to present you, uh, to you briefly, very briefly, what I consider a first crucial step towards improving outreach to young people. And that's an educational network I've been thinking about for some time. And this is not just another educational project beside all the, the very good and excellent projects and initiatives that already exist. And it's not in competition with that, but rather it tries to um, help these organizations and projects. It's, it's a kind of a meta project and it has two goals. It has a long-term goal and that is of course seeking structural um, institutional change in the future. So it means we need to establish ethical animal protection as an obligatory, mandatory subject in the system. It needs to go into the syllabi, it needs to go into the textbooks and everything and into the teacher training crucially, otherwise teachers won't teach it. And it also has a short-term goal, and that is acting on the current system as it is from the outside by putting the subject on the agenda, right? by raising awareness and starting the debate. So any kind of activities um, can help, like classroom visits from, from humane educators, all sorts of activities. Vegan cooking classes might also be a more hands-on approach, or vegan options in school or kindergarten cafeterias just to to, to start this debate and to establish the topic. The educational network also serves two functions. So the first function is making the existing organizations and projects and initiatives more effective and efficient. So we should try to avoid redundancies, people repeating the same mistakes all over again or don't even know or not even aware of the fact that there are others doing the same kind of work. So that is something that does not enable cumulative learning and we should try to, to work cumulatively, right? so to build on what has already been reached and not all start from scratch again because that's a waste of resources and time. 
I think it's also important that we network much more, that we promote cooperation, that we provide structural and coordinating support in all this. And the second function of this network would be to become a sort of central point of, of contact for all those seeking information, all those who have no idea about what animal protection really is about and how to teach it to children, but who show some interest. And I, I feel that a network might provide all the information, databases, and all these kinds of things, so you get all the information you need without having to do days of, of, of Googling and, and researching the internet. It should all be centralized so people easily get what they want. And of course, it addresses all kinds of people. Most obviously, it addresses the people directly involved in humane education and, and teaching animal protection. But I think also regular teachers are a very, very important group of addressees. We need to win them over for the cause because they are incredible multipliers. Right? They keep working for decades, reaching thousands or tens of thousands of individuals. And they might spread this message there. But I think we should also try to reach out to organizations and um, individuals who are interested in humane education, but who don't have an explicit focus on this. So we might tell them how they can benefit from this or how they can contribute to that. And of course, we need to reach out to administrators and officials. And here are some of the focus areas of this network. So this is a non-exhaustive list, of course, and I'm, I'm um, interested in getting more information and more suggestions from you later on how to um, complete this list. So what should be done is we should create databases right, to collect and spread information, of course, so as regards teaching materials, resources, teaching offers and requests to coordinate them, right, to, to get, bring people together, those who seek this kind of um, service and those who provide it. It's a huge problem usually. We also should organize and host specialized conferences and trainings and exchanges of ideas focusing on outreach to young people. We should, of course, also build rapports with educational institutions because that's a crucial element. So let me conclude. This is our goal, right? The, um, a peaceful world where humans and animals live together in more or less perfect harmony with un no unnecessary suffering and killing. It's probably a, weak, a vegan world, a, a, a world where animal rights are a reality. But between us and this world, there are these massive walls uh, consisting of the attitudes and behaviors of most people today that engender large-scale killing and suffering of animals. And in this presentation, I've tried to, to show that um, what we as activists, when we take our tiny hammers to these walls, we should be not only doing A, but we should also be doing and should be doing more of B. Right? We should also take care um, to make sure that the building process, the construction process of these mental walls is interfered with. We shouldn't just stand back and let it happen. And I think this would make our work in the future much easier and it would make the world a better place for animals. So I think in animal activism we need more people who are not only hacking at the branches of evil, I think we need more people who are also striking at the roots. Thank you. Hi, uh, first of all, thank you for giving this presentation. Uh, I think it's one of the uh, most well-phrased and uh, convincing um, uh, presentations I've, I've heard on the topic so far. So I'm, I'm really impressed by it. Um, and I would like to get a, a little bit more uh, practical. Um, do you have any ideas on uh, how we uh, can approach, um, well, governments basically, because you're, you're really, um, at that, at that level, uh, I understand, to get this into the school systems? And also, do you have any ideas based on um, uh, developmental psychology of children, what ages um, we, we should focus on? Yeah, thank you for the, your remarks. Um, I have to admit, I'm not a specialist in either of these areas. 
And that's why I think we need to, the first thing we need to do is we need to, to get the debate starting. We need to inspire more research into that by specialists. We need developmental psychologists to focus more on the connection between animals and children and the development of attitudes and behavior. So I'm completely incompetent to answer these questions because I'm, I'm a philosopher, right? I, I know everything but nothing, nothing really deeply. So, um, um, but I think your, your question about the, how to approach, I think the idea is we need to be very subtle and very, very um, let's say, clever in doing this. So I think there are lots of ways in which we can, first of all, um, rectify a very, very distorted image of animals. And that is something, I think, where there is very little resistance. You don't even need to, to, to use the word vegan or animal rights or animal protection or animal welfare. You just need to give the kids all the information about animals that is available now, and that's quite a lot. That animals are individuals, that, have, that they have friendships, right? that they have feelings, that they can be sad. That's something that's missing completely. It's up to individual parents to do this, to pass on this information, but it's not institutionalized. And I think that would be one of the first steps. And I think it wouldn't meet with too much resistance if we just said, listen, there's modern ethology. And they have been telling us for the last one or two decades, there's lots of new insights, new information we need to include. We need to update our view of animals without an explicit protection message. And that would even work at a very low, um, at a very early age. And I think that would also be something you could get into the educational system. Of course, I'm not, I'm not suggesting going to um, educational administrators and telling them, listen, you need to, you need to include the animal liberation message in your, in your textbooks because that's not going to happen. That's just simply not going to happen. But I think we can do this, and I, I trust children, because they are more sensitive and open, that they make the connection themselves, that they understand more, and they start thinking more. And in addition, we provide, let's say, vegan alternatives at, at school cafeterias. And that all kind of creates a very different environment in where they grow up. So at the moment, this is not happening. They grow up in a, in a carnistic world, and later on, they're confronted with the fact, hang on, there's a problem with that. There are lots of people trying to change that. And I want them to grow up in the world we already want. So change the environment completely. But I have no, um, I'm not competent uh, to give you exact answers about the, the, the direct steps to take. But I hope we can get people together and start the conversation and try to get the experts in to, to do the research and then tell us what would be a good approach for different kinds of demographics, for different age groups also, how to address kindergarten, preschoolers, how to address primary school, secondary school, and so on. So that's lots of, that, there's no information about this. The re research record is, is poor, and I, I think that's, that needs to be changed. Hello, Jens. Thank you very much for this presentation. I was very excited about it, and I think you did a brilliant job. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to mention that um, while we were here at the conference, um, that uh, I know that you're working on a kind of a meeting to kick off meeting to get this thing going, the debate going, or maybe maybe the, the cornerstones of the meta organization that you were talking about. Um, maybe you should mention um, that some of the people here from different organizations who are interested to put their time and resources into that kind of topic and working on the small wall instead of just um, with all their resources on the big wall, um, that they can contact you or um, set up a call with you or g get into a chat with you um, about that meeting and what is going to, to, to um, yeah, get this thing going. Thank yeah, you. Thanks a lot, Robin. Um, most important thing I forgot. Thanks, thanks a lot. No, that, that's my email address. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to receive emails. I'm also available to discuss matters, also um, to receive criticism, which I find very um, enriching. So yeah, I'm, and I have already, I've got a list with uh, contacts, um, people interested in the topic, and I will be here until Sunday, and I will try to get on everyone's nerves about this topic and get many people on this list, yeah. But thanks, thanks, Robin. Thanks a lot. Thank you.